Hi, my name is Sandy Simpson from Apologetics Coordination Team. This is an article I wrote back in 2000, and it's called Luring People to Destruction by the Unscrupulous Use of the Gospel, quote-unquote, Message. Now, I knew that when I wrote this that the article would be unpopular. The idea that people can be seduced by the unscrupulous use of the gospel message may sound heretical in and of itself. But you know, people like Benny Hinn have been credited from time to time with having preached the gospel pretty straight, and people seem to be professing faith in Christ. I've heard the argument from Philippians 1, 14 through 18 used over and over again in this regard. But let me uh, pose some questions that will hopefully help you to focus on this issue before I launch into my short thesis on this. If the Gospels truly preach, quote-unquote, and then people are invited forward to receive another spirit, what good was that Gospel message? Isn't this situation akin to what Jesus described in the parable of the soils, when he described the seed thrown on rocky soil or on the road? You know, if people believe for a while, a matter of minutes, and then fall away, what use is that? Uh, can a person be truly saved if the true gospel is preached, but another spirit is promoted, either explicitly or implicitly? Can a person be truly saved if the true gospel has been uh, preached, but another Jesus is summoned? One who's at someone's beck and call for signs and wonders, who can be thrown around the world and pressed into people's foreheads? What constitutes the preaching of a true gospel as opposed to a different gospel? If Jesus' death, resurrection, our desperate wickedness and sin and its penalty, which is death, the need of repentance and turning away from sin, the recognition and true belief that Jesus Christ came to die and pay the penalty and that he rose again and that we must give him total control of our lives as Savior and Lord. If the gospel is preached, but the Jesus is also a Jesus who is not sovereign but can be summoned to do man's will, this goes against his own word by urging people to empty their minds, throws people to the ground and into uncontrollable shaking and wailing fits, um, uh, goes against his revealed character by allowing dead people to appear in necromantic visions, tolerates disorder, does not require tongues to be interpreted, claims that there will be a new foundation laid by new apostles and prophets, goes back on his own word, where he stated that the end times would be a time of great deception and apostasy by claiming that there will be a great awakening and revival instead. Does the true gospel include true teaching explicitly and implicitly on the character of God and His Son, or is the truth not a requirement for salvation? Does God bring salvation from lies and deception and from false teachers? Where in the scriptures do we see the gospel being preached and people being saved as a result of a true gospel about, uh, about a false Jesus? Is there anywhere in the wor word where this was demonstrated as a normal way to preach the gospel? Were the other people Paul was talking about in Philippians 1, 14 through 18 preaching a different gospel? The true gospel, but about a different Jesus? Or the true gospel, but doing so out of wrong motives? Think about this. Judge for yourselves. Philippians 1, 14 through 18. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the truth of God more courteous, uh, courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of good will. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish, selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. Now, if you see what I see in this passage, this argument cannot be used for false teachers like Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, and the hundreds, even thousands of third-wave ministers today, who are not merely envious and self-ambitious, oh, they are, but are also teaching outright false doctrine. 
Paul was not talking about heretics in this statement, but brothers in the Lord who preach the gospel with, but with wrong motives. Third wave teachers not only have wrong motives, they also have the wrong message. This argument cannot be used for people like Benny Hinn, even if they manage to preach enough of the gospel for people to come to a saving knowledge of, of the Lord, because they're also teaching and practicing heresy. Paul made many incredibly clear statements about those who preach a different gospel. Galatians uh, 1, 6 through 8. I'm astonished that you are so quickly uh, <clears throat> deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even we, if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. You know, when another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit are preached, people are led astray. They're not led to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 11, 3-5 But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion of, to Christ. For if someone who comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus who preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, that's what we're talking about here, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. We're not to put up with it. If you do not hold to the true gospel message, then you've believed in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 2, By this gospel you are saved, but if, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. What does it mean to believe in vain? It means you're believing in something, but it's not going to help you. So what is the gospel? Before we get into that, here are some interesting facts to add to our often truncated modern version of the gospel message. First of all, the gospel was announced even to Abraham. Galatians 3.8, the scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. We are to stand firm and contend for the faith of the gospel. That is not simply the message of Christ's death and resurrection, but on sound doctrine. Philippians 1.27 says, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come to you and see you, or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. Colossians 1.22-23 but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his side, sight, without blemish and, blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moving from the uh, hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and it has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Titus 1.9 we must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. And you know, it's even implied that the gospel of Christ is, at the very least, the full story of the life of Christ. You know, at the beginning of, of Mark 1.1, uh, 1, 1, he says, this is the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's the story of Jesus Christ and what he did. The gospel is not only the bare-bones facts about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and, and it is certainly not saying uh, Jesus, quote-unquote, over and over again and running to the mercy seat. The gospel uh, message starts in Genesis, follows the prophets and apostles through the Old and New Testament, and ends in Revelation. By the way, Paul was preaching from the Old Testament. Any true presentation of the gospel always includes right teaching, however simple, on the core doctrines of the Trinity, the dual nature of Christ, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, the Word of God, which is inerrant and our final authority in all matters of Christian faith and practice, and that Jesus Christ is coming again bodily to rule and judge the earth. Well, you might ask, how can any preacher fit this all into one message? Well, you know, that's actually my point. 
It is possible. Uh, Stephen preached it and no one believed, Acts 7, 2 through 55. Paul preached it and a few believed later, Acts 22, 17 through 34. And Peter preached it at Pentecost and a number of believed, uh, Acts 2, 1 through 41. But it can uh, make for a long message and people today want the Cliff Notes version. And this is why emotional pleas for people to make a quick decision based on sketchy facts about salvation is not always a good idea. The concept of who God is, what his character is like, why he sent his son, and what his will is for our, our lives is something that needs time and effort to teach fully. This is why the apostles spent extended periods of time preaching the gospel in the places God sent them. Let's look at that. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how he lived among you for your sake. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.9 Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We work day and night in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You know, the preaching of the gospel is what all full-time missionaries who live on the foreign fields amongst the people need to do, and many have done for centuries past. The preaching of the gospel is what pastors are supposed to do systematically in the churches God has called them to serve. This is why making an altar call a regular part of every single service can be, in my opinion, a disservice to the gospel message. I'm not against altar calls, but... Every time? I don't think so. It's better to let the Holy Spirit lead in these matters. He knows when the heart of a person has truly come to believe in Christ. We as true believers need to be open to the leading of the Spirit in, this, in these matters, as in all other matters of faith. A person cannot be pushed emotionally into making a true decision that his mind, body, and soul have, not, uh, have yet to make. <clears throat> it's got to be given time. This is where the altar call in the third way becomes rather transparent. The ultimate goal is clearly not salvation, but numbers and hype. Salvation is a means to an end then. The gospel is being used to get people to come forward for the false anointing. And I've witnessed this with my own eyes. At some point in almost every third wave service, the eyes and hearts of the people naturally stray from the cross and the gospel and salvation, if they were ever there to begin with, and come to rest on people who have power to knock people over and put them into trance states. The emphasis is taken away from Jesus Christ in the cross, and therefore the glory is given to something or someone else. Angels are not said in the word to rejoice over signs and wonders, but over one sinner who repents. Repentance is incredibly important, Luke 15.10. Shouldn't the highest emphasis of an alleged third wave evangelistic meeting beyond the repentant sinner sent by, uh, set free by Jesus Christ and not on some sub subjective show of healing or slain in the spirit. People wiser than I have stated that the most dangerous time for a new Christian is the, at the moment when they profess belief in Christ. The enemy often uses that moment to bring the new professing Christian into bondage to another Jesus another spirit, another gospel. He will try to tempt the new convert to sin with the world and the flesh. He will accuse. He will try to con convince the person that they are no different than they were before. He will try to lead them immediately astray with false doctrine and practice. And you know what? That's exactly what uh, we saw in the third wave out of Toronto. Toronto blessing, Brownsville uh, outpouring, uh, uh, carried through by Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland on TBN and a multitude of other events and churches. And this has been demonstrated repeatedly for years. You know, we do not know the hearts of people who listen to people like uh, Benny Hinn, but as far as I can discern from Scripture, there are only three possibilities in the professing converts that Hinn claims to have. Number one, those who never came to a belief in Christ. Number two, those who believe for a moment and, f and then fall into its false doctrine. And number three, those who believe but are choked out by the things of the world and the flesh. Since the true gospel is never really preached, 
because of the false doctor present in those meetings, there is never a chance for true and lasting faith in the biblical historical Jesus Christ. The numbers quoted at Brownsville can then be understood to be fictitious. Why? Because you cannot have true salvation without true doctrine. It's impossible. The fruit of a false teacher is false teaching. The fruit of a false prophet is false prophecy. There can be no true fruit from a false teacher or false prophet. It's all bad fruit and will be thrown into the fire. If there is another argument I'm missing here about how people can possibly be saved in third wave meetings where unbiblical and heretical doctrines and practices are present, then I'd like to hear it. But if you agree with what I'm saying, then it's time to stop supporting third wave leaders by stating that people can be saved in third wave meetings. You can't mix it up. You can't have it both ways. So get the word out and warn people to stay away from those meetings because they're not helpful. Send them to a good church.